You know, if I could offer you one bit of advice, that would be don't go eBay shopping at 2 a.m. Because you might stick a best offer on something and then win a faulty Socket 7 motherboard. Now the faults on this board are pretty obvious. One capacitor has been rather forcefully removed here and there's a bit of damage around this IC. Also several bent pins around the board and someone has very kindly taken all of the little jumpers off it. So what we're going to do today is try and get this thing up and running. But the first place we need to focus on is down here where all the damage is. And as you can see, it is rather badly damaged. Only the legs of this capacitor remain. It must have taken quite a bit of force to remove the cap from its legs. And I'm surprised it hasn't damaged the board here as well. But at least that's easy to fix. This bit here though, this might not be so easy. Presumably whatever has knocked this and ripped that cap off has also hit this and bent several of these pins. Now, bent pins we can deal with. I can just uh, separate them again where they have joined, like here for example. These two are squashed together. But it's not just quite that easy because two of these anyway have broken loose. That's one there for example. You can see it moving slightly. And there's another one down here somewhere. And there it is there. That one is also loose. So first thing I want to do is go in with the multimeter and just make sure that the pod below is still making continuity through to the nearest via. So with the multimeter on continuity, I just want to check this quickly. So the third one along is loose. Yeah, that's fine. So the pod is still connected to the via here. So that trace is good. I was just worried that the pod had maybe ripped off when the leg itself had broke loose. The other one that's loose though is not going to be just as simple to test because it disappears underneath the chip. I just tested that off camera there and it's fine as well. So hopefully just a matter then of tacking those two loose pins back down again. Try and straighten out a couple of these other ones. Those first two there are touching. So we need to try and separate them. I'm not going to get too fussy over that because, well, I don't want to risk snapping off anymore. So I'm just going to separate them where they are touching to make sure there's no shorts. So if we can do that and change that capacitor, hopefully that will be enough to repair this motherboard. So plan A for reattaching these pins is going to be hot air. Now I could try and solder it, but to be perfectly honest with you, I haven't done a lot of soldering at such a fine pitch and I just don't want to risk making a mess of this. So what I'm going to do is use a bit of this high temperature tape and just mask off one of these pins at a time. Get a little bit of flux on the pad there. I'll try and hold the pin down with this screwdriver. Just apply a little bit of pressure to the top of it. Go in with the hot air and hopefully that will be enough to get it stuck back in place. Right, that is everything masked up. I know it doesn't look like it, but there is one pin there still exposed. I am just going to put the tiniest bits of flux on this. Yeah, less than that. And then it's just hot air. Here's hoping this works. Well, unfortunately that didn't work. The pin is still floating. Didn't want to go at it for too long with the hot air, the risk damaging the board itself. So I think we're just gonna to have to try the soldering iron. So a bit more of our flux. I've just tinned the end of this iron ever so slightly. And let's see what this does. Right, I think we're good. Yep, that pin seems to be down okay. 
You know what, that might actually have been the easier method than trying to use the hot air in the first place. Just try and do this other pin as well then. See, that's exactly what I was worried was going to happen. Well, we got there in the end. All the pins are tacked down. Got rid of my nasty solder blob up in this corner. Just wasn't using enough flux. I had to suck that up with a little bit of braid. Plenty of flux on and then wind up having to uh, reattach quite a few of these in the end. But it's done now. There's no shorts in it and everything checks out fine on the multimeter. It's all reading from the pins through to the nearest via. So hopefully that's now good. This capacitor though, what are we going to do with that? Well, this chip here is identical to this chip. So it stands to reason that this capacitor should be the same as what was here. This is 220 UF 6.3 volt. Now I don't have a 6.3 volt, but I do have this. 220 UF 16 volt. That'll do fine in there. I think so anyway. Get those two legs out. Get this in place. Then we need to try and find a manual for this board because over this side you notice all these pin headers here. And I dare say several of these will be for setting the front side bus and the voltage of the processor. So I'm going to have to find the manual, figure out what does what, put a lot of jumpers on, and then we can try and power this board up. So there's a new capacitor installed. Then after doing that, I was just going around the board, straightening up some bent pins, when it dawned on me that we're also missing two heat sinks here on these voltage regulators. So when we power this board up, it's going to have to be just a quick power on test or these things will very quickly overheat and uh, possibly kill themselves. If this board did work, I was planning on trying to benchmark it just to see how well it performs, but we're not going to be able to do that today. I don't have suitable heat sinks for in here, so if it does post, I'll get those ordered up and we can do some testing another time. So the processor that we're going to use is this Sarix 6x86MX socket 7 processor. Um, it's one of the only ones I have lying spur. Not the best processor by any means, but it will at least let us see if this board works. I know this is good, so we'll need that. We'll have to get a graphics adapter in here, but we'll worry about that later. We need to get the board set up for this chip. And for that, we need the manual. And to find the manual, well, it turned into quite the ordeal. I was searching the internet for quite a while, unable to find anything. It was then, with thanks to Andrew, over on the Retro PC Gaming Facebook group, he pointed me to this website, the New Auction Ukraine website. Strangest of all places to find a motherboard manual, but here it is. Just so happens to be an auction listing on this site that's ending on uh, Sunday. And thankfully, whoever has this listed here has taken pretty decent pictures of the first few pages of the manual. And that will let us set the jumpers for the voltage, for the front side bus and the multipliers. So after reading through what pages we have of the motherboard manual, it seems that we might not be able to use this processor after all this thing is looking for 2.9 volts but it seems the only voltages we can achieve on this board are 3.3 or 3.5 so probably can't use this instead what i think we'll do is use the pentium 200 out of the matrix mystique build this thing is looking for 3.3 volts and we can achieve that very easily on this board may as well just install the cpu and it only can go in one way being socket 7. so for 3.3 volts then jumpers 22 23 24 need to be shorted so 
Jumper 21 needs to be on pins 1, 2. Pin 1 is not labelled on the board, but it does seem to be labelled in the manual. And it would appear to be that way. Jumper 39 needs to be left open, but jumper 40 needs to be shorted. Where is 40? There we are. And jumpers 26 through 28 don't get anything on them. That is these ones here on the left hand side. Right, we need to set the multiplier then. And this chip is looking for a multiplier of 3. Which is jumper 18. And then it's looking for a 66 megahertz clock. And for that, we need to close pins 1, 2 on jumpers 36, 37 and 38. Right, I think that is this configured, ready to go. I'm going to add a heatsink to the processor. I know we're not running this for any length of time, but I don't want to take any chances with my good Pentium. I'm going to add a PC speaker, just on the off chance it tries to tell us something. We need memory. So I'll add this 32 meg stick of PC100 stuff, if it would go in. And we're going to need something to display graphics. And for that I'm just going to use this old Paradise VGA card, SA card, it can go in there. Then it's just a matter of hooking up power and we're using this old AT supply so always remember black to black in the middle just to hook up the monitor then and let's see what it says what do you think is it going to work is it going to beep at us is it going to give a picture is it going to do anything? Can't leave it on too long now because there's no heat sinks on these, but it should be okay for a few seconds. And we're getting absolutely nothing. So I've been having to look for any other possible damage on this board and discovered here on this trace that is very close to the edge of it there is a light scratch on the motherboard and the very edge of the trace just along that scratch has been cut. Now it does still measure okay between this point here and this via over here but when you look at it up close the trace is cut about halfway through, so I've just scraped off and exposed the copper here and we're just going to install a wee jumper across that, just in case that would be a weak spot. But also, on the bottom of the board, at this point here, this trace is even closer to the edge of the board and it is actually cut. There's a bit of a notch has been cut out of the board here. And along with that, the trace has gone. So again, I have exposed a little bit of the copper either side. And we're just going to run a wee jumper across that. Hopefully, this will be the problem. So we fix this and we'll bring this board back to life. So this is a better look at the underside of the board, where the damage is. You can see it quite clearly there, where the trace has been split. I've just exposed the copper either side of that. And all we're going to do is run a little joint across. I'm going to use some of this solid core wire here. So just strip a little bit of that wire off. Not too worried about the length of it at the minute. We can trim it down later. And that is going to go on there like that. First thing though, I want to just tin up the copper that is here. So a little bit of flux. And 
Then we can just hold this down in place using a little bit of blue tack, sort of like that. Now it's just a matter of tacking it in place. Right, I think that's on there. Just carefully remove the blue tack, and then we can just trim this down. And let's just check it with the multimeter. So from that pin there, through to this via. Yep, that is that trace fixed. So I'm just gonna clean that up with a wee bit of IPA on a cotton bud, and then probably just go over it with a little bit of clear nail varnish. Then I'll do the one on the other side and uh, we can test it out. Okay, everything is back together. Let's see what's gonna happen. We're gonna get a signal. It's not looking like it. Nope, that still doesn't work. Well, I've done pretty much everything I can think of here and there's just no signs of life, which is a bit of a shame considering that we've fixed the damage down here and repaired those couple of traces. I did find another couple of dodgy looking traces on the underside, which did read okay on the meter. You know, there was continuity through it. It really looked to me like they were cut. So I did just install wee patch wires again, but no difference. I've checked voltages across the board and everything seems fine. Tried different RAM, tried the ISA graphics card in each of the slots. Also tried a PCI graphics card in each of the slots, but doesn't work. Not that I think it's anything to do with that though, because well, if it was a RAM problem or a display adapter problem, you would expect the PC speaker to let us know. Fitted the new battery as well, just in case as this is one of these boards that, you know, won't boot unless it has a good BIOS battery, but nope, that is fine. Also tried reseating both of these socketed chips, even tried reading the BIOS out and, you know, our little EEPROM reader and it seems fine. So I am really running out of ideas. There are a few other pin headers about the place, you know, with no jumpers on them. You'll notice I've added one up here. This is on jumper six. Um, just with it having three, you know, pins on it and sitting right next to the BIOS. It got me thinking of the PC chips motherboard in the 46. It has a three pin jumper block sitting beside its BIOS chip and that lets you select between you know like high or low ROMs on the BIOS. So I've tried that there in both positions but uh, it doesn't make any difference. I suppose it's possible we're missing jumpers somewhere else. I mean we only have a couple of pages of that manual so perhaps there is something else that I am just missing here. But if anyone has any bright ideas of what I can try next please let me know in the comments section below. It would be nice to try and get this board up and running, but unfortunately so far it's looking like it's just dead. Well, that is it for this time. Thank you very much for watching. Unfortunately, wasn't able to get it working, but we tried our best and well, that's all anyone can do.